Um, I think that we're going to have record attendance at this case conference today because pediatricians are deluged with sleep problems, right? Right. In fact, sleep problems lasting more than one week are so common that 20 to 30 percent of healthy kids under age five are having a sleep problem at any particular time, and that doesn't even count all the kids who have various medical and mental health problems that have sleep problems. And in our presentation recently, the AAC, uh, in terms of infant mental health problems, sleep was way up there in terms of uh, uh, the infant uh, mental health diagnosis. Right, if you call it a mental health diagnosis, which it came well, out to be. It, it was, and, and that's, that's how our data shows. Exactly. And, and one of the problems is that if, if, uh, if the parents don't know that you have something to offer about sleep, um, they may or may not bring stuff up, but the child and the parent are both suffering. So the kid may be sleepy and irritable, and there are other um, bigger consequences for bigger kids. So, for example, school-age kids, uh, sleep debt can look just like attention deficit disorder or a mood disorder, can cause hyperactivity and learning problems. And in teenagers, get this, it's just as dangerous as being intoxicated to be sleep deprived when you're driving a car. <coughs> and I hope all of our doctors know that too for themselves. But um, this is really very important. When it comes to mental health disorders themselves, sleep Debt can actually destabilize things like bipolar disorder, makes mood disorders worse. And of course, the parents are exhausted, and when they're exhausted, they're irritable. So that doesn't help with things like oppositional behavior in the kids. And the studies have shown that if you don't do anything about a sleep problem, they tend to last at least three years. And that's only three years because the funding ran out. So they don't know how long it really lasts. It only knows that that's as far as they've studied it, but it didn't go away. Yet these are really pretty easy problems to deal with. So I'm so glad that you guys are all here. So I just want to point out a little bit about the normal development of sleep. So the first part of the normal development of sleep is to recognize that people go through cycles. So there they are awake at the top here where it says, at the top of the y-axis, it says awake. And the first sleep cycle of the night is the deepest one. And then after about 60 to 90 minutes, 90 minutes in adults, they go up into rapid eye movement sleep, which is between stage one and stage two. Then they go back down again. And each cycle after that is a little more shallow. Now that's really important because it tells you when certain kinds of sleep disorders occur. For example, sleep terrors, which we'll talk about in a minute, are occurring right here as children come out of stage three, four sleep. So they tend to happen in the first sleep cycle of the night, and this also has something to do with treatments that work. So the other thing that's important to know is what the average amount of sleep should be for kids. And if you take a look at your favorite kid that you know how long they sleep, tell me, are they getting this much sleep? And the one that's really the hardest, I think, is right in here, and teenagers. And that is teenagers in, this, in the United States typically get less than seven hours of sleep a night, and yet their real sleep requirement is between eight and a quarter and nine and a quarter hours. So there's actually some new data on these sort of brackets of normal sleep, and they've broadened the brackets a little bit, but actually the total amount of sleep really hasn't changed. So those are important things to keep in mind. So when you're thinking about assessing a kid for sleep, um, Judith Owens, who is one of the sleep mavens for pediatric sleep in this country, came up with this mnemonic, which I personally can never remember, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. And that is BEARS, so maybe like a teddy bear to take to sleep. And it stands for bedtime problem, excessive sleepiness, awakenings, regularity and duration, and snoring or gasping. So I'm going to sort of organize talking about sleep here according to those different problems. So let's start with bedtime problems, which is what Gary's case really had something to do with right away. So let, in terms of some general principles for bedtime sleep problems, the few things we know actually make sleep go better. One of them is if the person goes to sleep in a relatively cool, dark room used mainly for sleep. And by the way, the cool part is actually associated with less uh, 
sudden infant death syndrome too in babies, so not too hot. Um, used mainly for sleep helps with people who sort of get stuck doing other activities, and that's separate from not having any tonics on in your room, which is should be a general caveat. Even though, hey, get this, did you know that 25% of toddlers have a television in their bedroom that they can turn on themselves? 25%. So you got to ask because you'd never guess that that might be true. The second piece of sleep hygiene is trying to keep the schedule the same seven days a week because for some children who are very slippery in their circadian rhythm, even one night of sleep being off by more than an hour from its usual time can mess up their circadian rhythm and give them sleep problems. Most kids can tolerate two nights, but very few can tolerate more than two nights that are off per week. Um, avoiding exercise within two hours of bedtime is a good idea because um, vigorous exercise in that time frame actually makes it harder to fall asleep. Probably all of you know that. And unfortunately, that's when hockey rinks and things like that, and even basketball courts are sometimes available. So I've got kids who are seven years old who are coming home from basketball practice at nine o'clock at night, and of course they can't fall asleep because they exercise vigorously. So it's worth asking about that. Avoiding stimulants is important, caffeine, tea, nicotine for teenagers, um, and some medications that are stimulants. We'll talk a little bit more about ADHD and um, how ADHD-specific medications can either make sleep better or make it worse. And then having a bedtime routine. And you might say, well, okay, we're going to have a regular schedule. Why do you need a routine? And the answer is that we're all mammals, and so... We all know that in the middle of the night, a lion could eat us, right? So we need to make sure that our surroundings are safe before we go to sleep. Anybody ever notice what a dog does before they lie down to go to sleep? Turn what do they do? They look around. They circle. They circle and they circle. And they're not just looking if, to see if there's any pine cones they're going to lie on. They're actually looking to see if there's anything dangerous around them. So it's really important to help children feel safe at bedtime. And there's a variety of kinds of safe, right? But the most important one in the United States probably is safe from tension in the home. So avoiding arguing at bedtime, avoiding uh, violent media or media that's upsetting, and instead having something like a positive bedtime story or talking about positive all the bad things that happened that day you want to put in. Uh, please mute your phone if you're not talking. Thank you. And then, finally, avoiding sleep associations that can't be reproduced in the night. So sleep associations are those circumstances that make a child feel comfortable going to sleep. Um, but what happens is, since everybody wakes up in the middle of the night, everybody does, we, we don't want a sleep association that the child can't replicate on their own. Otherwise, they're going to want whatever it was, to be available again. So the most common body, con mo the most common sleep association is body contact. And the second most common is sucking on something that they can't replace. So in the case of babies, if they're sucking on a pacifier, it falls out of their mouth, and they can't find it to put it back in, so they wake up and ask for the parent to basically to replace their pacifier. By the way, you know the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends pacifiers at bedtime throughout the first year of life? Did you know that? And this is supposedly to prevent SIDS. Well, I have a theory about why it's true, and that is the reason they're not having SIDS is because they're waking up every two hours. <laughs> they sleep lighter, so I'm not a big fan of that. Um, so how do you prevent a sleep association from occurring? Well, by about two months of age, if you put a baby in bed at least a little bit awake, and if they fell asleep with the breast or the bottle, wake them up enough so that they are looking around when they're in their bed because this will prevent sleep associations. And you have to do this at nap time too, not just at night time. Um, now, there are kids who have a sleep association. The parent lies down with them. The kid falls asleep. The parent sneaks out of the room. Kid sleeps all night. There's no problem. Okay, if it's, don't, if it's not broken, you don't have to fix it. But if it is broken, like in the case of those twins we were just hearing about, then you really do need to do something about having the child out of body contact in the place where they're going to go to sleep for the night. 
Uh, any comments or questions about that? The key thing to remember about sleep associations is they occur at every age, and they're often complicating any other kind of sleep problem. So it's, they can be a problem all by themselves, but they're often present in other kinds of sleep problems as well because people resort to it, basically. Okay, how about the problem at bedtime of having trouble falling asleep? Well, usually this is what's called a phase shift problem. That means that the child is not sleepy at the time the parents want to put them to bed. And the most common culprit for this would be daycare. Daycare, because the daycare loves kids to take a two-hour nap in the afternoon. So a two- to four-year-old who's in daycare needs about 11 and a half to 13 hours of sleep, including their nap. So if they're getting a two-hour nap, and the parent wants them to go to bed at 7, they may not be tired, especially if the nap ends after 4 o'clock. So sometimes they have to spy. The parent has to go spy on the daycare and find out and convince them to either shorten the nap or stop the nap altogether. There are plenty of 4-year-olds who don't really need any nap anymore, but they're being put down by their daycare or their preschool. And the teenagers who sleep till noon on Saturday. Right, the teenagers. And, of course, the teenager who comes home to an empty house and takes a 2-hour nap also isn't tired at the usual bedtime. So naps can be a problem. Typically, children um, only have one afternoon nap after age one, and they stop naps altogether after age four. So that's a good rule of thumb. So what can you do if you've got somebody who's having trouble falling asleep? Well, basically, it's been found that if you just explain all this stuff to the parents and give them a chart, they can often figure it out for themselves. About 40% will solve their own sleep problem if you explain these things. Um, Increasing daytime exercise but not right before bed, establishing a nice bedtime routine. And then for the kid who's been falling asleep late, here's something really, really important and evidence-based that will help them get to sleep. And that is if they've been falling asleep at 11 after an hour, two-hour struggle with the parent, and then they're waking up at 8, they have to, the parents have to set a new plan to wake them up at the time they really should be getting up to get the total amount of sleep. And then work backwards. That means start putting them to bed at 11. Don't struggle for two hours and put them to bed at 11. Start putting them to bed at 11, but always wake them up at 7 every day. And then every night, move the bedtime up by 15 minutes. So you can pretty quickly get to an appropriate bedtime as long as you do this seven days a week. Of course, watching out for naps and trying to keep things like meals and snacks uh, the same all seven days of the week. Has anybody tried this work your way backwards plan? No. no. It works yeah. really well, and it works with children with neurological problems as well as typically developing children and is really kind of an essential uh, tool in your toolkit. So there you go. It's worth coming to the session just for that. Now, how about the kids who are taking a long time to go to bed, but they're going to bed at the right, ending up at the right bedtime, um, the official definition of prolonged routines is more than 30 minutes. Well, I don't know. Ray and I used to take more than 30 minutes to put our kids to sleep because we really enjoyed it. So remember, if it's not broken, you don't have to fix it. But if parents are getting stuck with the kid asking for one more story and one more thing, they have to limit that ritual and maybe get their special time in earlier in the evening so that they're not tempted to prolong bedtime because everybody's having so much fun but they're not getting as much sleep as they really need. Now, how about bedtime fears? So bedtime fears um, are really things that you see in preschool kids, primarily because at that age, children have fears uh, that come from the stresses in their life that they're aware of and also their own inability to manage some of their impulses. So they may have aggressive impulses, they've been hitting their brother, they know their parent is mad at them, there's a stress at the time they're going to bed. Also keep in mind that they may have had some media exposure that's made them frightened. I'm flabbergasted at what I see, people allowing their kids to watch on television or play in terms of video games. Also, you want to remember that some people who have fears at night are, have fears from the past, like PTSD, or they may be depressed. So what do you do about these fears? Well, again, you want to make bedtime safe. Um, getting special time in to help the child feel a positive uh, relationship before they head for bed. Making sure they're not being hit. They're getting appropriate limits. 
setting instead of corporal punishment, and the usual, watching out for caffeine, those are things that are important. But one of the things that parents sometimes do is they poo-poo the kids' fears, oh, they're no monsters, but in fact, from the kids' point of view, um, there really are monsters. And so acknowledging uh, it's a good thing that monsters aren't real. Monsters are really scary. That's acknowledging it. Good thing they're not real. And then teaching them some kind of coping or relaxation thing to do for themselves at night. And there's some wonderful books. Uh, Go Away, Big Green Monster is one of our favorites. It's a book with cutouts. So as the child turns the pages, the monster sort of disappears. Um, And another one of my favorites is to buy the kid their own flashlight to have by the bed and make it a big ceremony to go get the flashlight. And then if they're in the bed and they're worried about monsters, they can use their mastery, uh, their mastery instincts to grab the flashlight and look around and know that they're safe. And, of course, if that doesn't work, exorcism does. Oh, so you think I'm kidding about that. So an exorcism where the parent goes around the bedroom swinging a bat or spraying with monster spray uh, can be very convincing to young kids that the parent has taken charge and has rid the room of monsters. They don't see any sort of uh, conflict in the fact that the parent just said there are no real monsters for them spraying monster spray. Works really well. Now, how about the kid who's been put to bed but then comes out? Ta-da! That's why it's called a curtain call. Parents finally settle down to have a nice evening watching TV, and their little kid comes back out. So there are a number of reasons that this happens. Pretty typically, it's a combination of secondary gain, so some attention is better than no attention, right? A phase shift, because the kid's not really tired, or some combination of that. And some of these kids are kids who don't do anything else the parent says to do. So for the management of this problem, the first thing to do is to work on setting limits in general during the day, and then let the child know what the plan is, preparing the parent for excuses. And the plan can be a couple of different things. The idea is you can either give one more request, like say, okay, if you have one more thing you want, you can ask for it. And sometimes we give them a bedtime ticket for this. They have a ticket that they take with them to bed. They need one more thing, they can cash in their ticket. And most kids fall asleep clutching the ticket to their chest. Um, or the parent can put them back in bed silently without talking at all, or they can close and hold the door. And when they close and hold the door turn off the lights, the child, of course, will be upset. In about 10 seconds, the parent can open the door and say, okay, will you stay in your bed? If you'll stay in your bed, I'll leave the door open, and children typically will go along with this. Now, I like to combine this with what I call two-story, one-story, That means they get two stories the next night if they stayed in bed the night before and only one if they didn't. And you know that this flies in the face of of, uh, most behavior modification because you want to have the reward right after the child did the desired behavior, right? But in fact, why does it work? It works because the parent is reminding the child of the appropriate behavior. So tonight you only get one story because you got out of bed last night. Now, with little kids putting a screen door in or putting a gate up, Um, are things that are reasonable to do and thinking about the whole bedroom as their crib, especially for kids who have already launched themselves out of their crib but they're not really old enough to learn from these other things. It really doesn't hurt a kid to fall asleep on the floor. It's perfectly okay. And for kids who come out and end up in the parent's bed and the parents don't even know it, and there they are in the morning having gotten their secondary gain, um, you can put bells on the doorknob so that somebody has to wake up and take the kid back to bed without talking. So you might say, well, what's so wrong with the kid coming into the parent's bed if the parents didn't wake up? And the answer to that is that what happens is it starts happening earlier and earlier in the night. So the child starts sleeping lighter and not getting good quality sleep because they're always waiting for that opportunity to go into the parent's bedroom. So that's the main argument for why kids uh, should be taken back to their bed. If you're planning to have the child sleep in their own bed, you need to be consistent about it. Now, co-sleeping isn't such a bad thing outside of infancy when there's a worry about overlying deaths, but it's really um, the ambivalence about putting the child to bed in their own bed that causes the problem. So I promised you to tell you about behavioral insomnia of childhood. So here it is. Uh, This is an official definition, right? A child's symptoms meet the criteria for insomnia based on reports of parents or other adult caregivers and there's a, uh, a B and a C. So in B, 
we have a pattern consistent with either sleep onset association, which we just talked about, or limit setting type. Limit setting means that it's a big struggle. If falling asleep is an extended process, sleep onset associations are problematic or demanding. Usually that means the parent has to lie down with the kid. Um, in the absence of associated conditions, sleep onset is significantly delayed or sleep is disruptive, and nighttime awakenings require caregiver intervention. So that's sleep onset association type. And then limit setting type is where the child has trouble initiating or maintaining sleep, stalls or refuses to go to bed at an appropriate time or refuses to return to bed, and the caregiver demonstrates insufficient or inappropriate limit setting to establish appropriate sleeping behavior. If that sounds like your parents, you now know that it's actually something that the American Academy of Sleep Medicine has included it in its international classification of sleep disorders. Hooray! So let's talk about insomnia, which we're still on the bedtime, going to bed. So primary insomnia is actually pretty rare. It should be a diagnosis of exclusion, and it's almost always the real primary insomnia is adolescents and older. So insomnia is not really common. It's more a problem with phase shift or with anxiety or ADHD, which I'll talk about in a minute. But in order to qualify as real primary insomnia, you have to have at least a month of trouble falling asleep. It has to interfere significantly with functioning or cause distress, and it can't be part of another sleep or mental disorder. So some of the things to think about when you run into somebody who you think has primary insomnia is the things we've talked about a little bit already, too much exercise close to bedtime, smoking or caffeine, napping, sleep association, or a child who has uh, fears in their bed from sexual abuse. Also remember that breathing-related sleep disorders like obstructive sleep apnea, asthma, and restless leg syndrome, even though the child may not be awake for these, can set up negative associations with going to bed. So the child is actually afraid to go to bed because they have experienced basically hypoxia or restless leg when they've started to go to sleep. So we'll say some more about that in a minute. So if it's really primary insomnia, there are a couple of things you can be doing. One is reduce daytime stresses, desensitize them to the bed, sometimes altering the layout in the room, taking the alarm clock out of the room, and putting the adult back into the sleep routine. Maybe the adult can read together or just talk with the, with the child, um, even older kids. Um, and then the routine that's used for adults is that if they don't fall asleep in 10 minutes, they should get up, stay up for an hour, and then try again. And what this results in is a sleep debt so that they get less sleep while they're working on this, but they get enough sleep debt as long as they get up the next morning at the appropriate time and don't take any naps so that they are tired enough to fall asleep. Now, there are medications that have been used for primary insomnia, including melatonin and clonidine. Ambien, I'll say some more about later, is addictive. You want to watch out for that, but those are medication treatments for this problem. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, let's keep going and talk about circadian rhythm disorder. So I already mentioned the importance of phase shift, but one of the things that you may not know is that the Earth probably used to rotate in 25 hours instead of in 24 hours. So actually the natural circadian rhythm cycle is about 25 hours long. And so there are some kids who have what's called free running circadian rhythm disorder where they keep trying to stay up for 25 hours and it messes things up. And that can be pretty hard to treat. But what's more likely to be a problem to resisting to go to bed is that they have oppositional behavior or they're in a late phase shift and so they're difficult to get up. You can tell this because they're difficult to get up in the morning because they're going to bed too late for what they really need. Um, in an early phase shift, they may fall asleep early, but they also get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, which is not desired by the parents. This is the right amount of sleep, but at the wrong time. And, of course, teens who prefer late bedtime. Um, activities, especially on the weekend, can also um, mess up the sleep cycle. So oftentimes it looks like a circadian rhythm disorder, but it's really a cycle that, for example, teenagers prefer. Okay, so now let's talk about the second time. So that was bedtime no, problem. Let's, now let's talk about excessive sleepiness. And there's a few primary sleep disorders that include excessive sleepiness, narcolepsy and hypersomnia, and they even have codes. These are not very common, 
Remember that dysomnias can also be ca caused by chaotic or noisy yeah. households or overly tired kids who have trouble falling asleep because they basically stayed up too late and now they can't settle down. Yeah. Um, but dysomnia can also, NOS, can also be used to describe other kinds of insomnia that don't meet disorder. And don't forget restless leg syndrome. So how about anxiety? So trouble falling asleep is very, very common in anxiety. And sometimes waking up in the middle of the night is part of anxiety as well. And what can happen is the kids can actually start to obsess over how long it's going to take them to fall asleep, and they're worried about the next day. So if you ask them, what's happening while you're lying in the bed? What are you thinking about? And I ask them that question. And they say, well, I'm worried about, you know, whether, whether I'm going to uh, be able to do the homework for the next day or I'm worried about the test for the next day. Um, those are things. Or if they're worried about the well-being of their family, this can be part of separation anxiety. So uh, the kinds of anxieties that you see, fears for the relationship, may be because the child has acted badly enough during the day that the parent's been mad at them, and that's where you need to uh, help with calmer limited special time and managing any ADHD that might be present. And then for internalizing disorders, sometimes sleeping with a sibling or with a dog or having a nightlight on can solve the problem. And again, I don't think it's such a bad thing to sleep with your parents unless the child is being used for the purposes, the sexual purposes of the parent or a reflection of marital discord, which might be true in the father on the sofa that Gary mentioned earlier. Maybe he just doesn't want any more kids having two-year-old twins. <laughs> I want to make sure that that doesn't happen. There are kids with obsessive uh, compulsive disorder and removing the clock or turning it around can be helpful. There are kids who have trouble sleeping right after their toilet train because they don't want to wet the bed, but they know that they can just sort of barely hold it together. Sometimes it's appropriate to stick them in pull-ups so that they can relax enough to go to sleep, and I see that a fair amount, actually. And then they may have uh, nonspecific fears or even specific fears which need to be addressed, like being bullied or PTSD. So 85% of kids with ADHD have disturbed sleep even before they've ever been treated for ADHD, but ADHD medications can also affect sleep. So some of the things that you need to pay attention to in ADHD, and I should mention autism as well, is good sleep hygiene, enough food before they go to bed, because often kids on stimulants haven't actually taken in enough calories for the day, and the parents are resisting uh, giving them food at 8.30 or 9 o'clock at night, but in fact they actually need it. And in some cases, giving an additional dose of stimulant in the evening for the ADHD actually helps them settle down. Occasionally, children need medication to help them with their sleeping. Keep in mind, stimulating medications, nobody's on theophylline anymore, but antihistamines can do this too. So they're treating the kids' allergies, and the kids are revved by the treatment for their allergies. So you want to be sure to think about that. And think about kids who have a seizure disorder because both valproate and diazepam mess up your sleep cycles. So you really basically should never use medicine as the first line treatment for sleep. Um, first of all, these medicines have side effects and some of them are addicting. But the other thing is that just giving a sleep medicine is hardly ever resolves a sleep problem without the behavior management. So you should really be doing the behavior management. But if you decide that you need to do something in terms of medicine and sleep, um, my new favorite is actually uh, sublingual melatonin between 1 and 5 milligrams. Even 10 milligrams is okay. Right at the time of going to bed, because nobody ever remembers to give the, the slow-acting melatonin an hour before bed. So being able to give it right before bed can be really helpful. Um, I do prescribe clonidine sometimes for kids, especially with ADHD. It may have some benefits on their ADHD, too, as a matter of fact. But... Um, but I know Emily said that she doesn't. Emily, do you want to comment on not yeah, using Yeah, um, I, I, I don't care for clonidine. I, don't, I, I really try to stay away from sleep meds because I'm, I'm more concerned it's either a behavioral problem or it's a symptom of a different syndrome that needs the syndrome treated, whether it's the ADHD, anxiety, or depression, um, rather than thinking about each symptom as it's a standalone target of medication. Um, if I think it's related to ADHD, I'm going to reach for guanfazine well over clonidine, much better data, um, much better tolerated than clonidine is. Um, 
So I just, I, I think the other thing that happens, because clonidine is so sedating, once you get a kid on it and families like that, it's really <coughs> hard to get them to stop using it. And I don't, that's a really tough place to be with a family. So, and it, it allows them to not learn the behavioral interventions. So I, I really try to avoid sleep medication in general, and then clonidine would be at the bottom of my list. I, I have one that would be lower than clonidine, and that's a Benadryl. Well, yeah, I mean, but of, of the um, clonidine and guanfacine, I, I would pick guanfacine over clonidine. Okay. Right. I think Thank the you. Benadryl probably ought to come off the slide, actually, uh, because there's data that it doesn't help, and, and it's so likely to cause drowsiness and inattention the next day, especially in kids with ADHD. That's just what you're trying to avoid. Um, that uh, I don't think, and, and it's used a lot in pediatrics, I know that, and, and uh, I think it um, causes problems. It doesn't solve anything. And you may notice that the ones on the bottom there, I also say with counseling, because anybody right. who is using trazodone or ciproheptidine to go to sleep needs to be in some kind of therapy because that's not appropriate. Um, I never prescribe Ambien. It is addicting. It has carryover sedation, and it loses effectiveness. Let me just mention, though, that there's some data that giving a medicine for kids with severe ADHD, giving a dose of, their, of an ADHD medicine at night can be helpful. And Intuniv and Concerta are both ones where you, you seem counterintuitive to give a Concerta at bedtime, but in fact it helps carry them through the night if they're extremely restless. So it's something to just think about. That okay. should probably uh, only be done in consultation with somebody else. I think that would be a very unusual step. I have never done that as a child psychiatrist, and so I think that would should be worth consultation with somebody. Well, the, yeah, the, the well, data, data, give an data. HS dose of, of Concerta, because that's not standard of practice, so that should at least be a consultation with a colleague. Okay. I, I agree. Uh, the, the data was that when you gave when they used to have three times a day. When you gave that, people were afraid to give that third dose. Right, that's different, third than, dose, that's different than Concerta that's, at that time. No, I, I, I'm trying to make that distinction. Yeah. That would, get, that would settle them down by the time uh, they were, uh, it was bedtime, and that, that was effective. That, I, I've never done Concerta at bedtime. So these things, are, let me just point out again, this is not what you should do first or probably even second. And the other kinds of things we've been talking about actually work pretty quickly. So it's not a matter of waiting months or years. It's really a matter of weeks of trying these other strategies, which almost always work. So I just want to mention some tough kinds of sleep, things for excessive sleepiness. Narcolepsy is mostly in 15-year-olds and up. It's uh, almost always associated with this gene here, HLA-DQB1 star 0602. Um, and what it has in it is attacks of irresistible daytime sleep, automatic behaviors, and abnormal REN transitions, and sometimes cataplexies, paralysis on going to sleep, and hallucinations at bedtime. So just keep that one on your list, but remember that if you see things that look like this, you ought to be ruling out hydrocephalus, brain insults, and central nervous system hypersomnia. So that's a pretty rare condition. We're talking about less than... 0.1% of the population and basically teens and older. There are some interesting things about hypersomnia, though, and that is uh, children uh, past the newborn period who are sleeping more than 12 hours at night but also still tired um, can have a kind of hypersomnia that can look like um, hyperactivity and restlessness and poor concentration and even sadness rather than sleepiness. Um, the most common reason for hypersomnia is always lack of adequate sleep. Um, chronic sleep disruptions, though, can cause this as well. And the most important one to know about is breathing-related sleep disorder. So the kids are in bed plenty long enough, but the quality of their sleep is not restful enough. And that's pretty serious. So I'll get to that in just a minute. The other thing to keep in mind is that you want to think about um, uh, well, this is the actual definition of primary insomnia, which has to go on for at least um, the periods of excessive sleepiness have to be at least three days, several times per year for at least two years. So it's a pretty strong requirement. Um, keep in mind menstruation-related hypersomnia, which is a real syndrome 
of cyclic hypersomnia and hypersexuality in girls related to their periods. So that's a weird one, right? And remember that if people do have primary hypersomnia, the most dangerous thing they can do is be driving a car. So you want to watch out for that. So let's talk about night wakings, which is more common. And the most common ones um, are nightmares, sleep terrors, and sleep walking. And the one that's most common in the young kids is developmental night waking. Now, what this means is after eight months post-term age, children have developed the object permanence. And they go to sleep, but when they wake up, they are aware that there are people that they'd like to see who are not present, and they start to cry for them. If the parents don't reinforce this by, by picking them up out of bed, it'll go away in one to four weeks. But sometimes it's quite acute, often after the child has been ill and the parent has been attending to them, or after the first time they get a babysitter to take care of the kid. The kid wakes up, sees the babysitter, starts to scream, and every night after that they wake up. So this is pretty common, and it's often also associated with sleep association, so you want to keep that in mind. But it's really pretty easy to treat once you explain to the parents what it is get them to do a bedtime ritual, maybe have a transitional object and a nightlight on. But then when the child starts crying in the night, they should go in after two, uh, two minutes of crying. So don't go in right away. Wait for at least two minutes to see if the child's going to settle. Then reassure them verbally and stay in the room, but not in body contact and not talking. If they do that, the child is now mad instead of frightened. And it takes a, typically four nights, I always tell people awake, I always tell people it'll be a week, but it typically takes about four nights before the child doesn't wake up anymore because they've gained confidence that the parent is available, but they're not getting the reinforcement. If they've got a child who's crying when they're put, first put down to bed, that's where desensitization by moving the chair a foot closer to the door each night uh, can be helpful. Nightmares can occur as early as 14 months of age, and they're very common, so half Almost half of six-year-olds have nightmares. Um, if you have a child who suddenly developed nightmares who didn't have them before, think about lifetime stresses, medication withdrawal, abuse, or PTSD. But night nightmares can be helped by preparing the child for good dreams with a nice story. Usually a, a made-up story might be good. Reassuring them that the that nightmares are not real. And um, intervening in their room only briefly. If they wake up with a nightmare, they're typically doing that in the latter part of the night, so after midnight or after 2 a.m. when the, they're in that lighter phase of sleep that I showed you in the first diagram. I don't recommend medication for nightmares, and I've never used it. Um, night terrors is different. This is that waking from stage 3, 4 sleep that I told you about in the beginning where kids look terrified. They're screaming, pale, tachycardic, they're sweating, their pupils are dilated, they're thrashing around, they're incoherent, they're inconsolable, and they don't remember a thing in the morning. Everybody else does, but they don't remember. These can actually be brought on by some weird things, noises. Uh, excess fatigue brings on night terrors because it shifts that first deep sleep cycle. A full bladder can do it, so if they didn't go to bed, didn't pee before they went to bed, and stress. So these are occurring in the first 15 to 90 minutes of sleep and often will have multiple bouts per night so many times per night for several days in a row, and then suddenly they stop. And then often a few weeks later they come back. 50% uh, of these go away by age 8, but almost about a third continue into adolescence. So this is really scary for people. So what can you do about that? Well, first of all, helping them know that this is not a mental illness, an emotional illness. Um, they should avoid secondary gain by looking too frightened when they go in to attend to the child. Decreasing stress, making sure they pee before they go to bed. And an afternoon nap can actually fix this because what happens with an afternoon nap is that it decreases the stage 3-4 sleep in that first deep cycle. Another way to do it is to wake them up one hour after they fell asleep and tell them to go back to sleep. Do this for about a week. And that, again, disrupts that first deep sleep cycle. Of course, when children are having night terrors, they can sometimes get out of bed and be in trouble in the house, so they have to be protected. And actually having an adult sleep in the child's room may interrupt a cycle as well. Again, I don't recommend treat medications for this. These are things from the literature, but they're really rarely needed.
Now, I'm going to tell you about one of my least favorite sleep disorders because our son had it. <laughs> Confusional arousals. Now, this can happen at any age, but they're typically gone by adolescence. But what happens is that young kids sleep so deeply that when they transition from stage four to REM sleep, they may be thrashing and moaning for five to 15 minutes. And you've got to watch out. You can get your nose punched in, but they don't know what they're doing. Um, this may even extend into the second half of the night, although it's usually less serious at that time. But when it happens is when the kid is overtired. That would be our son coming back from grandma's house in the car too late. Um, when we took him out of the car, he would go nuts. It was really quite difficult. But ill or stressed children or children with altered sleep schedules are also susceptible to confusional arousals. Um, so uh, some of the things that go along with this in the family can be other disorders of stage 3, 4 transitions. So sleep terrors, enuresis, although it's not all stage 3, 4, it also occurs in 3, 4. Um, sleepwalking and sleep talking are all things that can occur at that kind of ran, at that kind of time in the sleep cycle. Um, uh, if the best thing to do about this is to make sure they get enough sleep and manage the stressors such as the fatigue, illness, or, or stress factors. Um, medication could work, but again, I don't rec I don't recommend this. And you don't really need to to do a sleep study to confirm this diagnosis. It's so characteristic when you hear about it that you can. Uh, provide recommendation without that. Now, another one that's kind of on the scene right now is restless leg syndrome. Now, the reason I want to mention this, even though it's mostly in adolescents and, and adults, um, it's highly familial and it gets worse with age. It's the cause of many uh, geriatric sleep problems because what happens is the person goes to sleep, but then their legs and arms have brief, painful, or uncomfortable jerking movements during stage two sleep as they're falling asleep, and that wakes them up. And it's really, really uncomfortable. So for adults, some, they have support groups for this sort of thing. Various medicines have been tried for this, but these are really should be reserved for sleep specialists. But I have to tell you that iron supplements can help, even if the child is not is, even if the child is not iron deficiency deficient, mm -hmm. and also massage and cold compresses can help with these rather severe cramps. So it's valuable to ask. Sometimes you'll hear about kids who have who who are violent in their bed, and you didn't think to ask about the fact that it might be restless legs. So it's something to keep in mind. Now remember, and Emily knows this better than anybody, that sleep disorders sleep is a very delicate. It's like the canary in the mine, and so any mental health disorder can be associated with a sleep disorder as well. In the case of depression, there can be increased time to fall asleep and reduced latency to REM sleep, but this is much more common in older people with depression. The early morning waking you see in adult depression is not so characteristic of childhood depression. Emily, do you want to comment on sleep disorders and mental health? Sure. I mean, the other thing I would say in depression we see is frequent wakings during the night in kids and teens, um, so it's not just difficulty falling asleep or early morning waking, but difficulty staying asleep um, is also something we look for. Um, I would say that sleep problems can go in either direction, either too much or too little, um, for pretty much any disorder. And so it isn't only decreased sleep. We do see um, kids who are depressed who are sleeping too much. And so for me, sleep is really more of a yellow flag that I, it's a marker of I need to learn more to rule these things out because they, their treatment will, if you treat an anxiety disorder or a depressive episode, the sleep will, be, will get better as part of the resolution of that illness and doesn't need any other targeted intervention necessarily. The other thing is that families need some education about how sleep may be part of the syndrome rather than something specific to be targeted. Um, and so there's both psychoeducation but also more data gathering that a disrupted sleep pattern can be a yellow flag for. Very good. And we also have to remember that sometimes the medicines we prescribe, even if we're prescribing them appropriately, can cause a problem with sleep. SSRIs are known to make it harder to fall asleep, but um, I don't think that's a terribly common side effect and it's worth the benefits that you get, but something to think about. Mm -hmm. 
Well, let's just talk about regularity for a minute. I think the, the key regularity problem is teenagers who actually like to keep their own schedule, whether it's good for them or not. They typically stay up too late. They have to get up too early for school, and even though laws are being try, trying to be changed about this, it's taking a long time. They may be awake with electronics either at bedtime or even in the middle of the night where they're receiving text messages. Um, and they may be uh, preferring to be asleep during the day to avoid parents or to avoid school. So some things that work with people who are way out of whack with their sleep as teenagers is to either work the schedule, excuse me, work the schedule backwards or forwards by one hour per day or to stay up all night to reset their clock. Now, that may, their biological clock, that may not be quite enough, but then once they do it, they have to keep the schedule within one hour of the, of the planned for bedtime and waking time, seven days a week, in order to really have this work out. And this can be tough because the teen is not actually interested in fixing this problem. So a lot of this takes motivational interviewing to even get a chance at it. Now, I would be wrong if I didn't talk about breathing-related sleep disorders. Preemies have central apnea, but the main kind of apnea we see is obstructive sleep apnea, which is defined as five 10-second apneas or a DSAT below 50% of normal every hour on a sleep study. But get this, it can occur as many as 300 times per night and even cause failure to thrive. I think I saw one last week where this child was three years old, his tonsils were totally occluding his airway, and he's failing to thrive. And I think it's probably going to turn out to be from his, uh, his tonsils and his obstructive sleep apnea. So 75% of people with obstructive sleep apnea snore significantly. You can hear them from the other room. But that means 25% don't. So if you suspect this, you need to go get um, a sleep study because the consequences of obstructive sleep apnea are bad mood, aggression, hyperactivity, poor attention and memory, trouble with visual motor, uh, abilities, even hypertension, corpulmonality, and death in adults. Now, that doesn't happen in children particularly. Mostly in children, it can be resolved by a tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy, but all of us now are seeing sleep apnea associated with obesity. Um, and, of course, if you complicate this with alcohol or drug use, um, that is really very serious. And uh, any syndrome that affects the upper airway, like Pierre Robin, can also be associated with obstructive sleep apnea. Those things can be hard to treat, so getting a sleep specialist in on it can be very valuable. I just want to tell you uh, at the end here, we have lots of tools in Chattis to assess sleep. Uh, the BEARS tool, which covers those things I just talked about, and a French version of BEARS called the Hibou. But the Children's Sleep Habit Questionnaire is 53 items, and we thought that was too long. So what we did was we combined the bears into an algorithm with the sleep habit questionnaire so that the smallest number of items, which is 10, could be asked to determine actual sleep, possible sleep diagnoses. So this is a screenshot not of the actual bears but of the items in the bears, as you can see. It's about falling asleep, sleepy during the day, waking up at night. Here's some more items. from, And this childhood sleep questionnaire, which actually I did that with Dr. Owens, uh, starts with asking about bedtime weekdays and weeknights, but then drills down into questions about sleep apnea, risk for sleep apnea, and uh, other signs of excessive sleepiness or inadequate sleep, and gives you diagnoses like this, where you can actually see the problem of night waking, sleepwalking nightmares in this particular case, tells you how much sleep the child is getting, gives you all the details. I have a comment then. Mm -hmm. Uh, my comment is that uh, uh, often the most common thing we see is sleep association with limit setting, and they go together. And um, and they can be simply uh, uh, fixed, but uh, part of what we're managing is the parents' expectations and providing a structure for the parents. I'm going to say a little bit about what I do that that's, seems to work all the time. Um, uh, first, we, we need to help the parent understand that they're not, you know, if you just do it all at once, the, the kid is going to rebel and the parent's going to feel badly and you're setting them up for failure. So I have the parent stay in the child's room, not touching them, and, and have the, the structure of the reading a story and so forth, and, and then talk about um, 
how they're going to manage, you know, that this mother, the parent, is uh, not mean, and, and, you know, they they know they can be scared at night. So you ask the child, do you want a nightlight on or off? Do you want the door open or closed? And the kid's not interested in that at all because that's like air. They, of course, they're going to have the door open. Um, but then they, they say, okay, if that's fine, you can have these prerogatives for uh, your, your feeling of being separate from me. Um, but, um, you know, if you get up or you talk after this period of time, uh, I'm going to close the door. So you, you never have to close the door at that time. The parent goes over and it starts to do it, the kid breaks, and then the, you've got the kid's attention. In, in uh, one week, I think in four or five days, uh, 99% of these will, will go away, but, but you need to have, I think, uh, a, a structure for the parent. You're going to set the kid up to be relaxed at night because the parent's there, not touching them. And uh, you're going to set the parent up to not be a mean person because they're going to have a structure for discussing the, uh, the, the association problem. So those are, that's the way I approach most of the cases. Always works. Great. And I see that Dr. Sakina had a couple of comments here. Um, one was for, to get suggestions on how to get parents removed media from the child's bedroom. <laughs> that's really... That can be pretty hard. So as with any kind of behavior change, um, they have to have decided that this is something that's worthwhile for their child's well-being and sleep, and it's part of their responsibility. Now, let me just say that I always warn parents that there's going to be a struggle and that if they give in, it'll just be worse the next time. So that's one basic behavior modification thing to know. The other one is that if the television is too large to move, I hear this all the time, I simply lock the cord from the television into a lockbox so the child can't plug the television in, and that way they don't have to move the television out and can allow the child to watch their videos or whatever they want during the day, but be able to control the television at night or simply remove the cord. The other thing um, Dr. Saxena said was that Atarax is a good choice because it helps anxiety as well as sleep. Well, that's true, but Atarax has a cumulative effect so that it both loses effectiveness and causes daytime cognitive dulling. So you want to be really careful about that, and I would be, I would be cautious on, on the use of Atarax. There's an FDA warning for using too much Atarax because it's been associated with cardiac arrhythmias, and mostly in older people, but, but otherwise. It does lose effect over time. Um, the other thing about media that we're running into now is that there's teenagers who are on these online games with their buddies, and uh, and it's sort of um, the you know the, the group ethic is that uh, you put everybody else to sleep and nobody you know wimp but you give up too early, so you're up against this whole social pressure of their peers who you don't know they're there in the bedroom, but they are there by the online. Uh, a game that they're engaged in. That's a tough one. That's a tough one, right. And then